Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. I'm Kiana Irvin, uh, Assistant Professor of History and Faculty Affiliate of Black Studies at Mizzou. My colleague, Dr. Gary Kramer, and I would like to welcome you to the second lecture of the spring 2017 season of the African American Experience in Missouri series. And Dr. Kramer um, is the Executive Director of the State Historical Society of Missouri. We're thrilled and honored to have Dr. Shawande Mustakim um, as our guest speaker. So allow me first to begin by recognizing and thanking um, the many people who make this series possible to Dr. Hank Foley, who's here tonight, uh, Dr. Kevin McDonald and Nora Azizan Gardner of the Division for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, Mary Ellen Lohman, Geneva Pace, and Melissa Wilkinson of the State Historical Society of Missouri, Ashley Schwab of University Events, Eric Doyle Wright of MU Diversity, Susan Cameron of the, of the Academic Support Center, and to all other staff members, thank you for your continued support and your enthusiasm for this project. Now this lecture series is a collaboration of the State Historical Society of Missouri and the University of Missouri's Division of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, uh, featuring leading scholars from across the country, including Drs. Diane Muti burke Martha Jones, Walter Johnson, Lee Vanderveld, Brian Jack, who's, who's in the house, uh, Miller Boyd III, and Clarence Lang. The series is designed to offer the community opportunities to learn about the history of black Americans in the state. So after Dr. Mustakim's lecture, the series will continue on April 4th at 6.30 p.m. in this room with a talk by Dr. James W. Indersby, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at Mizzou. He will discuss the story of, or the research from his latest book, the story of civil rights activist Lloyd Gaines, who played an instrumental role in the eventual integration of the University of Missouri in 1950. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shirwande Mustakim, who's originally from Atlanta, Georgia. She is a recently tenured associate professor. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Jointly appointed in the departments of history and African and African American studies at Washington University in St. Louis. She received her Bachelor's of Arts in African American Studies from Elon College in North Carolina. She also completed her Master's degree in African and African American Studies at The Ohio State University. And years later, she earned her PhD in Comparative Black History from Michigan State University. Some of her research and teaching interests include Middle Passage Studies, Atlantic World Slavery, Black Women's his History, Gender, Violence, History and Memory, Criminality and Policing, the Social History of Medicine and Studies of the Black Atlantic and African Diaspora. She has published several scholarly articles and book chapters and received a host of national fellowships for her earlier research, which traces the gendered history of slavery and the slave trade. This work is now publicly available in her 2016 book, Slavery at Sea, Terror, Sex, and Sickness in the Middle Passage, which was published with the University of Illinois Press. Today's talk is an extension of the macro-micro historical gaze that Dr. Mustakim has for many years extended to not only the contours of violence, gender, blood, exploited lives, and discarded bodies, but most of all, murder and shadowed behaviors and moments in black history. So following the question and answer period, Dr. Mustakim will sign copies of Slavery at Sea, so buy a book and stick around to chat. Let's welcome her to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. You never know what will bring people here, and I'm honored. So let me start by saying that. Thank you, Professor Irvin, for the introduction. Um, again, it's good to be among, let me say this, historically interested people first, and those who are interested in Missouri history. I don't always have an opportunity to talk about this particular case because everyone doesn't think about the centerpiece within Missouri and a lot of the histories that are held here. And fortunately, I was able to tap into a pretty bloodied story that I think will keep a lot of people's interest tonight, and it has um, since I've uncovered it. So really, I think I kind of want to open up because titles matter to me. They matter to me and what they look like with a lot of blood, using those right keywords. You all heard a lot of terror and sex and sickness and blood and those things that draw people. I tell my students all the time, if you have ghosts, 
if you have sex or you have murder, somebody's guaranteed to show up. So today I said, well, let me throw in a little bit of blood and then we can sort of tease that out because for me, I do, I trace blood, I trace bodies, and I look for those things that are overlooked, that are underlooked and deserve so much more so we can begin to get a really holistic understanding of many histories, American history, Midwestern, um, black women's history, just all the various things that you all heard that I'm interested. I am that nerd. I grew up reading and reading and reading, and, and fortunately I remembered and was able to put the networks together. So tonight, again, I want to really build on that, but I, I open up because I want you all to know that there's just intentionality for me everywhere with all of what I do, because when we really look at the bottom line, you can see so much more. And we're at an access point with a whole lot. And so it's even representative. There's a lot of things going on in society that we need to be there, we want to be there. And again, going back to tonight is that night that Effie Jackson and Amanda Umble will get their, their due. Their names will now vibrate in your minds for the first time for some people. And for others, it will foster up all other aspects to this very interesting and very complicated case. So again, for me, I'm very drawn to the overlooked and the forgotten. So for me, this is an access point. Yes, on one hand, tenured. This is a turning point, but it's for me much more of an expansion in terms of how I can go even deeper in all these other ways, but also standing between centuries. I write about the 18th century, but I've uncovered this fascinating case at the end of the 19th century that allows me to stand between centuries. And that's not something a lot of us are trained to be courageous, to be bold enough to do. And I did. I didn't care because I was like, these stories need to be told. But nonetheless, when you stand between centuries, and some of us, when you've lived between centuries, you have a much wider perspective on the landscape and evolution of human behavior, again, when you pay attention. Um, so again, for me, I, I never find myself drawn to the so-called happy in black history. I have a lot of students say, when are you going to find the happy? And I'm like, the happy is when the stories are told these unknown. So for me, I'm used to tracing people that there's no name. I'm used to uncovering what happened in number 28. And now that I have names and I can look at census records and things that had not been available, what happened is that slavery helped me to tell and begin to see freedom and the fragility of freedom in whole new ways that we haven't quite come to because we're still at the celebratory. And we need to be at the celebratory. But at the same time, we need to look at these complexities, again, that I'll be able to tease out more within this particular case. So for me, everything is an awakening. It's an activation, because you can't unknow. And that's what I always tell my students. You hear me now, you're not, you may say you'll forget, but you cannot unknow. And so as a historian, I see that we see between worlds. And for some people, it's a gift or it's a heavy burden. But it is the remembering. It is that your task, with, when you're seeing between these centuries, it's the remembering making sense of it and channeling and moving past the, the anger, if you will, or moving to a place to be able to share these stories. And for me, it has been that evolution in my entire learning about black history, black culture, and also black studies itself. Because again, to understand one, you have to understand the world in all its capacities. And so for me, there are many ties that bind um, within all of this, because violence, crosses all racial and ethnic boundaries, as we know, as we see constantly and unfortunately. And so it's always that opportunity that violence can detonate in the households and communities and nations. And most of all, on the global stage, on and off distant waters, marking humanity in ways that will and do outlive, uh, outlive us and, and will continue to reverberate within future centuries. And I know some people say, OK, how do you know? And I know because I've seen a middle-aged black woman blindfolded, gagged, tied to a chair, left for dead in the middle of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, simply because she was too old and diseased and thus useless to a Rhode Island um, ship captain eager to make money off of the still healthy cargo at sea in 1791. I know because I've seen a 19-year-old black woman viciously stabbed and left for dead in an alleyway 100 years later because she sought love through another woman's lover and boyfriend in 1891. I know, too, because I actively choose to remember the 15-year-old girl shot in the head by another woman 100 years later because she was black and because she was female, and she caused fear in 1991. So again, already I've laid out three centuries of black women at the center of violence, either allocating it 
or being the recipient of it. But yet, these stories are unremembered and they're overshadowed. Oftentimes, the way I would describe it are by these muscled black men or those who are seen as bold and their stories are more interesting and worthy to remember. But what about the discarded, the left behind, those who were the recipients of rage like Effie Jackson? So again, I am fascinated by the dark shadowed histories that some choose to sideline or alter and also that are not celebratory. I'm okay with that, but it's when we can move past icons, when we can begin to texturize the many histories, we get even more. So the moments that make, may not make us feel good, but it's tracing the patterns and within it, as I sort of end in my book and my epilogue, I'm always trying to, I'll say this, not force, but begin to nudge the reckoning with a deeper, darker, haunting like shadow of angst and horror and shame at its absolute lowest of humanity because then we can begin to see how far we've come or how far we've not and how, again how we have evolved through behaviors. So again I think about that at this place we hold on the headlines but when we look at the content and the footnote stories and the testimonies of human living and suffering that the headli headlines actually conceal then we're able to go in to go to the archives and really think about where are the stories that are devoid of books and multiple articles common public understanding, or even untouched by popular culture, meaning that there are no Netflix or Amazon series that we can binge and watch. So a lot of these people still, um, and again, within this case, we'll see that it operates on the edges of our memory, and it's not quite our fault, or maybe it is, but nonetheless, in the sense of looking at that bottom line. But again, for me, when I think about crime, and I'm thinking about criminality, I'm thinking about just sort of all of what it means being a non-native of Missouri, it's allowed me to sort of understand Jesse James is just, just constantly, he's, he's, he's treasured within this, this iconic history. And on the other side is Lizzie Borden. And so in this sense that we see the remaking of these stories over and over and over, and this is almost kind of marking between 1880 and, 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 and the 1890s, but yet there's so many women that I've uncovered, particularly black women, who committed crimes, were in jail, had been um, subject to execution well before or in between this mark of time. So it's been kind of interesting when you begin to sort of think about who and what it is that we choose to remember. So today I'm gonna take us back to, into Missouri's historic past, but again, through black women, at this turn and this corner and this crevice of American history that is, it can very easily be overlooked, but it is so important because those closing decades of any century reveal so much more as, as, any, as, as you're finishing and trying to prepare for the new beginnings of the next century and how you want to be understood, how you, wanna, how you want to exemplify a community and a nation and all these beginning understandings. And so, um, and really going in to understand this case, once I found it, and I should admit that um, it was almost, it was a sideline case. Just like the 70, 1791 murder article that I found, both cases, I showed up at archives for a, a completely different reason. This time I was taking a student to the Missouri State Archives to show her how to be in the archives, and I said, well, while I'm here, let me just look to see, do you have anything on crime? Do you have anything on women? And what I did is I started going through the one archival box that we had, and I began to really look at, okay, what's there? And at that time, I met Amanda, in a prison intake sheet and it just said 50 years sentence to prison. And at the time I was unimpressed. And that was because I'm so used to decapitated bodies and castrations and all kinds of things that to me it was like, okay, 50 years, what'd she do? And it just said first degree murder, but there were no details for me to really sort of gravitate. However, that night when I went home, everything would change because then I see that it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And so, Again, in thinking about what impresses us or not, I've been faced with that and, and almost really thinking about the guilt of, again, who do we choose or who do we not? And so as I learned more about the story, originally I wanted to tell the story from Effie, the murder victim side. And actually the title of the talk today connects to her, drenched with blood, you know, presenting a frightful appearance. And that was because the murder victim, and I'm always thinking about this, and we think about those who are victims of violence, they're lost behind the sensationalized headlines, and we want to know more about the criminal, and 
the foods they eat and where, where they go and, and those particular lives. But I wanted Effie to be at the center of the story, but yet an opportunity came for me to tell Amanda's story, but really a double lens. And so through that, that's when I began to see much more that is there. So to, to begin, Amanda Umble migrated from, and again, in beginning, I want to sort of set up a framework so you all can see what I was using to begin to understand all of this. But Amanda migrated from Sedalia to Kansas City, Missouri during her early mid teenage years. Her exact reasons are unknown. She may have left in hopes of greater economic opportunities to provide for her family, followed a relative or friend, or even been forced out of the house. Her mother had died years earlier, so she would have left to go to Kansas City around age 14, 15. So relocating to a much new and larger city by herself, Amanda joined scores of many other African Americans who filtered into Kansas City. For some, it served as a way station, a transition point between the North and the South, while for others, it represented a gateway to economic opportunities within a booming urban um, city. Black populations underwent massive shifts and growth with less than 200 black, um, with less than 200 black residents in 1860, and by contrast, an estimated 13,000 African Americans in 1890. Now, what's interesting is that Amanda navigated urban life within an area called Hell's Half Acre, a section within the west bottoms of Kansas City that in the late 1860s served as a home to black migrants and European immigrants employed in the construction of the Hannibal Bridge. Less than two, year, two decades later, it became infamously known as a sanctuary for thugs and grifters, given its cheap housing. Um, and so within all of this, Amanda fell in love with a young man um, who was a local porter at a saloon. His name was William Jackson. And they forged a relationship within this web of poverty, overcrowding, and violence. And their relationship expanded over the course of two years. And during that time, William worked in what many of us can understand, a bar or a saloon that is one of the most publicly sought out urban spaces or urban amusements where people can bring their fears and their concerns and really place them almost in the bottom of a glass, place them in conversations with strangers. And so through this thriving nightlife within West Bottoms, we see that William had access to so much more, so many more strangers, so many more other women, and so much more that Amanda was unable to really always keep sort of tight and knowing what was going on. But even more, when we think about Missouri itself, because there's so little history even looking at race and saloons at the turn of the 20th century, that even when I look at what people think about Missouri and its history, it's, it's left with many. So in that sense, I find the history of black life in Missouri, it's centered on slavery or freedom suits or music, race riots, civil, civ race riots, civil rights, labor struggles, social welfare and urban decay, but most of all, Celia's slave becomes that point of reference for anyone in thinking about race and gender. Of course, in thinking about that Celia who killed her owner in the 1855 case, in defense against um, years of psychological torment and sexual abuse endured, for which she hung, of which, again, she killed her owner. So as I delve further in researching this case connected with Amanda and, um, and Effie, two central questions were in my mind. When we look outside of slavery, how do we, how and do we even map violence within the interior lives of African Americans freed from the social control of plantations and societies? But then even more, what type of emphasis is placed, if at all, on these moments? So again, is everything about the happy moments and the celebrations, or then when do we begin to sort of look at the emotional breakdown and the rage? And so. Throughout the post-emancipation period, you find that black people, they moved in and out of various spaces, reconstructing families, seeking economic opportunities, and forging new ties of friendship and love and community as they set out to live lives of freedom. And so for Amanda, it was the same thing. So in this era of freedom, what I find is that power shifted out of the hands of former slave owners, moving instead into the wider domain of the state where Amanda and Effie's contentious interaction, because we'll get at, there was a, a May 15th, 1891 is when everything would change, but their interaction grants access to the underworld of everyday poor and working class black life in 19th century. Now, but what is important is that Amanda's rage that resulted in the death of another woman, it's not, it's far from unusual. 
But our actions fell within common patterns of rage, or at least what I saw as common patterns of rage, eruptive, violent, and plainly visible tensions that regardless of race or gender, again, as I mentioned, can detonate anywhere. And so um, within all of this, to try to understand, because what happens, again, we'll get into that, after the murder itself, she begins to move through what I call the pyramid of power. And it's important because there I'm looking at these layers, this omnipotent hierarchical, hierarchical structure um, that constantly is there, but invisible, but always can intrude upon the lives of anybody who sort of operates outside of the lines or the, the boundaries of social deviance. And so with that, again, by pyramid, by, by pyramid I mean this base of structural power held by the state to legally overturn and disrupt lives. And so through this, Amanda filtered through police county holding, criminal court, state prison, the Supreme Court, and many other sort of circles within that. And her murder, the murder that she committed of Epi Jackson, what is important is that it publicly cast black women as more than homemakers and domestics and leaders, but also murderers and convicts. And so, this entire case to me really sort of reveals the fragility and thus the cost of freedom and also sort of this unchecked power. So again, Amanda navigated urban life within Hell's Half Acre. And again, as I mentioned, she had befriended William and these, how should I say, that over time, the increase of more strangers and particularly one young woman, a 19-year-old black woman from Kentucky by the name of Effie Jackson caught the attention of William. And Amanda was unafraid, and she would go check William to let him know, I saw you with this woman. You better not go back. You better stay away from her. So we see these interactions that sort of lead up to May 19th, May, May 15th, I'm sorry, that are important. Because in fact, Amanda even goes to Effie's home. And uh, her, um, Anna Carew, Effie's landlord, she testifies to overhearing Amanda declare, no woman can go with, with her man that she would cut her guts out and that she would cut her deep. And so this open exchange, obviously within the streets of Kansas City for all to know, um, it would serve as an impetus for the tensions that would sort of um, develop even more within a month's time. It would be fueled on both sides because two or three weeks before the stabbing, Amanda confronted William again about talking to Effie at the saloon as she secretly watched the pair from afar hoping, however, that an aggressive one-on-one -on -one would prompt them to finally end this ongoing affair, um, she warned William again not to talk to Effie. Now, on this particular night, May 15th, Amanda had gone out looking for William. She had gone to his house and found out that he was at work. And so she had gone home and gotten dressed, and as she said, fixed her dress or sort of sewed um, a hole in her dress that had been torn. And so Amanda hurried to the saloon. But in going to the saloon, she unexpectedly ran into Effie and William on a date. They'd actually gone bar hopping that particular night. They had gone out and Effie had asked William to walk her home before he went to work. Well, serendipitously, they would run into one another and it would be that the street was dark, but quote, the electric light on Fifth and Campbell enabled the trio to recognize one another. Unbeknownst to Amanda, her lover saw her about 15 feet from where they were. And in fact, Effie leaned into William and said, there comes Amanda. So again, we see this just constant, like um, there's this, this awareness on all sides within this particular um, trio. But nonetheless, discovering the two of them out, Amanda walked over to the couple and immediately questioned William. She had asked where, where he had been and said she was looking for him. And then she said, I'm sure you've probably been out with some of your women. And at this point, Effie, feeling emboldened by um, a night of spirits, sort of approached Amanda and said, it's none of your business. You know, who are you talking to? And she was like, you're not married to him. And that's when Amanda responded, it's none of your business. I was not speaking to you. She turned to face William. And so within this moment, Effie went towards Amanda as though she was going to strike her. And according to sources, she jabbed her, Amanda jabbed her in the side with a, a knife that she actually had had inside of, her, inside of her dress. Now, according to William, he only saw a fist. So he didn't, in his mind, he just saw a fist go up and he didn't think anything had happened. William's, his memory is quite interesting. Um, but fearful of another attack, Effie fled. And she fled down 
um, around the block and, and particularly down an um, a alleyway, but leaving Amanda and William behind, although stabbed. And as she darted away, William got hold of Amanda, Mandy, and tried to stop the fuss, as he said. But Amanda jerked loose and ran into the darkness after Effie. Now, during this time, what would happen is that Amanda would catch up with Effie and begin to stab her and begin to disembowel her. She would stab her multiple times, and there would be other neighbors that would hear, and they would actually hear them wrestling around. In fact, there was a neighbor who had said that in the alley right behind my coal shed, she heard them fighting. And at 10 o'clock within that same stretch of alley, a German immigrant by the name of Miss A. Kainz, she put her family to bed, and all of a sudden, she said she heard a terrible scream. She thought it was her dog, then she heard a second scream. And then all of a sudden, she heard someone exclaim, I got you now for going with my fellow. Curiosity attended, the, you know, of course, the sound of the unfamiliar voices, yet the woman confessed, I couldn't see anybody. It was dark, all my children were sleeping, and I went back into the house. And so you see that Effie and Amanda, are, their bodies are jerking and twisting on the open road, and Effie called out for William. And it was interesting, in the court, they asked, why do you think that Effie would have called out for William? Of course, Amanda's like, I don't know. But for her, it would be even more annoying that someone that she's you know, placing all her love on, or, or, or at least expecting love, I should say, that injured and unprotected in a dark and, and empty alley that she would see this other woman calling out for someone that she loved. But nonetheless, William would come back, and he would separate the two, but what would happen is that they would leave Effie bleeding and left for dead pretty much in the middle of the street. And what would happen is that he pulled Amanda away and took her down to Fifth and Cherry, another, pretty much a, another part around the corner. Um, and um, understanding the consequences of what happened, the stabbing and all of it, he had asked Amanda about the knife. And she claimed she couldn't find it, didn't know, she thought she had it. Um, and so again, if you see this constant denial. But what had happened is that after, so Amanda had threatened William and said, you can't go back there. If you do, then I'm going to do the same thing. You know, I'm going to cut you up. And so what happens is the two of them separated. William went to work. Amanda pretty much fled. And then during that time, the police had discovered Effie in this alleyway. And again, that's when we get this, the description of her being bloodied. They pull her from the side of the road. And then they send her to the old city hospital. But they also take her to the police station to interview her, although stabbed, which is very interesting. Before she gets to the hospital, she just goes to the police to explain what has happened. But she only lives for one more week. So in getting even more deeply into this particular story is that Amanda evades the police for almost about a week more. And again, Effie does not die until about a week. But what's interesting is that this is when we begin to see, again, the intrusion of um, the pyramid of power within this time because Effie had ran away to a friend's house and asked to stay there and, and really had even thought about fleeing across the border over to Kansas, over to um, Rosedale. But what she did not know at that particular time is that police were ransacking her house, going through all her clothes and, and, and questioning all her neighbors and really trying to find out who's responsible for Effie's stabbing. And so hours after the incident, officers had learned where Amanda had stayed. And again, we see the house was actually, um, in fact, searched twice. And so in moving from room to room, they found some of her clothes, or what used to be her clothes. Um, and then the day following the stabbing, readers learned that at 1 o'clock this morning, the police were still looking for her. Unwilling to give up their search, they kept a close watch for her two or three nights in a row. And then when asked in court if she actually evaded the police, Amanda immediately responded, I never was chased by those officers in my life. Contrarily, one policeman recounted that they had gotten sight of her, chased after her, but she had gotten away. So according to Amanda, she turned herself in, but nonetheless, once she is within the confine of the police, everything changes. Days after her arrest, Amanda was arraigned on the charge of murder, further revealing the immediate nature of state power. Now, during court proceedings, she allegedly made no attempt at denial and pleaded guilty. She was committed to jail without bail to await jury action. And through the eyes of the media, Amanda maintained a stoic disposition while claiming guilt for the crime committed. Having fled the scene of a crime, evaded police, and left a severely injured person to die, authorities were unwilling to risk another escape or outbreak of violence. Amanda's legal fate, despite growing popularity on her case, did not regain public attention, however, until 
a month and a half later. So as the nation celebrated its independence on the 4th of July, 1891, news circulated that the special grand jury appointed by Judge White of the criminal court, um, they were saying there were some of these more interesting cases in Kansas City, included Amanda Umble, who allegedly sliced Effie Jackson, her rival. She sliced her in the ribbons at Fifth and Campbell Street. So again, we see the media begin to take on deeper or try to create even much more sensationalized understandings um, of the murder itself. And so again, she was charged with murder in the first degree. William Jackson, um, Umble's William, uh, woman's, what it says the Umble woman's lover, as accessory to murder in the first degree. And in fact, William was really sort of used to be able to get the case to move forward to get all the details because without William, there would have been no, no details for this particular case. So within this pyramid of power, these legal charges function akin to um, institutional scars, demarcating a person's entry into the legal landscape while likewise defining how they were preliminarily, preliminarily viewed by the state. So prior to her arrest, Amanda may have considered the law simply as the police and by extension the surveillance imposed within Hell's Half Acre as officers casually patrolled the neighborhood. Jailed and disconnected from family, friends, and outside world made more clear the balances of power between fugitive uh, police and jailer in prison. As this integrated punitive system restricted Amanda's behaviors, movements, meals, clothing, and overall sense of well-being, while at the same time tying her to the instructions and demands of police officers and guards stationed to oversee and manage the holding of all county prisoners. Unable to pay for an attorney, Amanda, quote, was tried as a poor person and her lawyer was appointed by the court. These measures were far from legal favors provided for those financially destitute. Instead, the accused were assigned to um, a representative of the state, a court-appointed attorney, and in turn expected to entrust their fate and thus their entire lives to the decisions and negotiations of strangers. So throughout the penal process, Amanda endured significant losses, yet particularly she endured, well, what was unparalleled was the treatment of a black woman in the media that affirmed the mark of hypervisibility and the loss of privacy that criminals would confront. So in that regard, Amanda may have yearned to escape the piercing public gaze her story began to fuel across the country once cast as a convicted murderer. However, she was no longer able to live a private life, owing for many reasons, but most of all, the fact that various iterations of the same article title, Woman to be Hang, this particular title and the same story would reprint with her name in full view across newspapers throughout Indiana, Minnesota, Texas, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and of course Missouri. Looking beyond race, the possibility that a woman, not even so much that a black woman, but that a woman would face a death penalty held a particular appeal for many. And so newspapers near and far professed Amanda's, Amanda Umble's execution will be the first execution of a woman in Missouri, which only fueled public interest in the legal outcome. Yet while calling even greater attention to the murder and murderess, five women, in fact, four black and enslaved, along with one white female, were executed in and by the state of Missouri between 1828 and 1855, neatly disproving the claim that Amanda would have been the first. In fact, she was the second black woman to face the death penalty in Missouri post-slavery. Amanda's forthcoming execution created a groundswell of interest, and as stories continued to filter, the public never lost sight of her blackness. One of the most commonly touted aspects of the case was that, quote, she murdered Eva Jackson for alienating the affections of her lover, of her dusky lover. During trial, the defense several times tried to call attention to Effie's size in hopes of better establishing their plea of self-defense. She was about five feet, six inches tall, one police officer testified, to which he added that Effie was in fact a very well-proportioned, strong woman. Conversely, outside of the courtroom, readers learned far less about Effie as journalists tried instead to give insight into Amanda, this unknown black woman accused of capital murder. And so what we find is that descriptors extended beyond mere mention of the Negro woman and the negress, or simply labeling her as colored. Instead, both race and size took full precedence, where within Kansas City, Amanda was cast as a small brown woman or the young mulatto woman, and on another occasion, a lithe little colored woman with a thin face and prominent cheekbones. Now beyond the heartland, however, 
She curiously grew in both color and body structure, racially constructing her as a criminal. To be sure, an Ohio newspaper pointed out, Umbles is a big black woman, while in Minnesota, the Duluth Daily News report, reported that Umbles is a big black wench. These articles reveal not just the permanence of race in 19th century America, American media, but moreover, the entanglement of race, color, and size as factors used to construct an archetype of black criminality. So knowing the lethal effect of the death, death penalty would have on their professional reputations, not to mention their client Amanda, Amanda's lawyers quickly considered um, the preemptive opportunities still available. Um, and so within this, we see that again, they're really sort of trying to point to Amanda's impoverished status. And within that, it, what we find is that it further tightened the reins of judicial power due to a life of instability, devoid of a permanent residence, as well as any discernible form of employment that could have paid in, or could have aided in paying for her legal troubles. However, the cost of unfreedom extended beyond physical displacement, going further to include the invocation of monies as tools of power held over convicts. So in being deeply enmeshed in the system and thus Amanda was dependent on her lawyers and on these particular men to help, essentially help free her, she was reliant on their ability to navigate Kansas City's legal landscape through available, available expertise, personal connections, and finances that they could extend on their client's behalf. And so in fact, um, in February of 1893, we find that Amanda actually tried to commit suicide while in prison. And there was a headline that came out, doesn't want to be hanged. And that can be quite misleading for some until you read the story. Although, again, rather misleading, readers learned that instead of posing any threat to her jailers or, or fellow prisoners, she tried to drastically subvert the state's control over her fate when she attempted suicide in her cell last night by taking morphine. She told a cellmate what she had done and asked her to take her belongings after death. We cannot know how she obtained the morphine, whether she requested it to manage an outbreak of pain or if she secretly stole pills or perhaps got it from another prisoner. Nor can we determine how much she ingested in hopes of claiming her own life. Knowing full well the magnitude of her capital case, prison authorities and medical officials were immediately notified, after which um, a county physician was summoned and antidotes were administered. So the timing of her suicide is noteworthy. Her lawyers submitted the necessary files and documents in July of 1892 for the Supreme Court decision, yet arguments were not made until February of 1893, precisely the same month when Amanda tried to take her own life. And, and of course, in here we could say any one of her lawyers, prison officials, or security guards could have shared the progress of, or the proceedings um, to her. And it's more than reasonable that time spent in jail and psychological isolation wove a greater sense of guilt or even defeat which laid bare increased thoughts of killing herself. But nonetheless, once recovered psychologically to the satisfaction of prison and medical officials, Amanda's story fell back into obscurity until the ruling of the high court was announced. Okay. And so within this, um, hold on, I think I'm page turn, I'm sorry. All right. Um, so there, again, Months of public silence went by as prior proceedings and printed briefs from both the prosecution and defense were considered behind closed doors. But most pertinent to the appeal beyond any simple forestalling of Amanda's execution were the procedural errors that within this that her lawyers had argued. They argued the trial court erred not on instructing the jury on the murder in the second degree or manslaughter in the fourth degree, the incompetency of William as a witness, assuming that William was not an accomplice, and that Effie's dying declarations were improperly admitted as evidence. So again, we sort of see all these contentions on all sides, but the panel of judges within the state's highest judicial body, much like the 12 jurors previously assigned to Amanda's case within the criminal court who had actually sentenced her to hang originally, on May 2nd, 1893, the Supreme Court delivered its opinion and final ruling that stripped away the veneer of innocence and legal mistreatment Amanda's lawyers sought to project. When we consider that her victim was unarmed and powerless in her hands, they wrote, Amanda's conduct can only be um, denominated as atrocious. To characterize such a killing as anything less than murder would be a travesty upon law and justice. Aggression she callously visited upon an unarmed person further sharpened the, sorry, the judicial view of her as ruthless and incapable of respecting the law. 
And to be sure, the ruling emphasized that the Fifth Street brawl was a deliberate murder actuated, actuated by hate and executed regardless of all the instincts of humanity. And so this legal um, insertion, it reinforced assumptions really about pathologies linked to notions of race, violence, and criminality among urban communities during the 19th century. But yet the, uh, the Missouri Supreme Court was not tasked with resolving a series of romantic disputes, but eradicating chaos and disorder is exemplified through Amanda's socially and legally intolerable actions, at least from their estimation. And so from, looked at from their eyes, her real crime in their eyes was being unmanageable and essentially operating outside the boundaries of social order. And so by aligning their ruling with the Jackson County Criminal Court, the Supreme Court projected a united front grounded upon the maintenance of law and social order. To be sure, by rescheduling her execution for the very next month, on June 22, 1893, they likewise inscribed the expeditious need for punishment by death while symbolically asserting the disposability of Amanda's life. Now, what would happen is that it would, um, it would attract the attention of many, including the Color Women's League, um, a lot of very notable uh, progressive era reformers and activists that this case would sort of represent a turning point within Kansas City politics. And in that regard, fully aware of the racial politics of advocating against death penalty by way of a convicted black um, female murderer, you see that the Colored Women's League really did align with, again, um, other local women that were interested sort of in, in the penal reform, but really looking at what does this mean for a woman to be executed at this particular time. And so as stories began to spread further revealing Amanda's plight, an interracial critique aimed at the gendered bias anchored within the pyramid of power represented by the, cake, um, by the state quickly began to emerge. The very thought, as one newspaper read, of hanging a woman, even though guilty of murder, was declared barbarous, um, barbarous and a blot upon civilization. And a week before Amanda's planned execution, Readers were reminded that unless the governor interferes, the death watch will be placed on the woman Tuesday. So operating quickly, a group of women, including Josephine Yates and um, Emma Lumen of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, agreed to travel to Je uh, Jefferson City to meet with the, um, the governor at the time, William um, J. Stone. And in doing so, they, their intentions were to expose the mistreatment that Amanda faced, and they pointed also to the fact that there was another black man tried for the same crime, but yet because he had money and he had a job, all his appeal and everything was completely different, and yet his death sentence um, was commuted, in fact, from death to 20 years in prison. So in the long run, because of these efforts, um, these progressive era politics that really would swell, again, around Amanda, what would happen is that on June 13, 1893, Governor Joan wrote the Secretary of State explaining for reasons un um, satisfactory to me, I have this day commuted and do hereby commute the said Amanda Umble to imprisonment in the state penitentiary for the term of 50 years. So again, we see a, a black man, same crime, um, 30 years less. Days before she was scheduled to hang, the marshal of Jackson County told her that the governor had decided to spare her life, to which Amanda commented, well, that's all right, what do I get? And the marshal explained that she must stay behind the walls for half a century, and she, marked, and she remarked, well, that's a good while, I'll be an old woman then, and turned away and walked off. Although hopeful um, of having her death sentence overturned, Amanda likely never anticipated a lengthy prison term. So on Friday, July 7th, 1893, after two long years of trial appeals and citywide protests, Amanda was transported over 150 miles to Jefferson City, where she was to spend the majority of her life within the Missouri State Penitentiary. And it's only through these brief um, prison intake notes that we see she was five foot one, size four shoe, with a generic description of black, given to her complexion, hair, and eyes that we gain a visual entrance. And so time passed, and Amanda faded in public memory as life as a prisoner became a daily and seemingly permanent reality. Yet seven years into her sentence, <clears throat> A 1900 census conducted within the penitentiary revealed that Amanda's life, um, that she actually, along with the lives of 21 other black and um, white female prisoners, was rigidly dictated under the constant surveillance of several guards, a yard master, physician, and matron. Now, what once may have seemed an impossibility, though, became real years later. And that's because, ironically, on the 4th of July, again, we see this marking of 
the day of so-called freedom within Amanda's life on all sides. But on the 4th of July, 1901, the Missouri governor, um, Alexander Monroe Dockery, made a legislative decision demonstrating the extensive legislative power held over Amanda. And he also wrote the Secretary of State on her behalf, but in this time explaining, in accordance with a custom for years observed in this department of pardoning at least two convicts from the penitentiary on the fourth day of July, I have this day pardoned Amanda Umble. Although knowing full well and briefly recounting that she had previously been charged with murder. And quote, she's the oldest female prisoner in term of service, to which he added, the custom has been to pardon from among the oldest prisoners having good records. The day before her, lease, interest, before her release, interestingly, news circulated ironically outside of Kansas City as a St. Louis paper, The Republic, reported that the governor, quote, issued three pardons of long sentence men. Although described as male and invariably regendered within the media in many ways for the crime committed and the time spent in jail, Amanda, along with two other men, William B. Johnson and James Horsea's sentences, they were all pardoned, thus freeing them from a life behind bars. And so um, sort of bringing it all towards a beginning in and then adding a little bit more of what I uncovered is that after Amanda got out of prison, um, she actually would find the love that she was trying to seek but not with William. In 1909, she would get married. She would marry a man um, from Warrens, Warrensburg. His name was John Miller. And in fact, he was a, the gardener and the butler to, in fact, the richest family in Warrensburg. So that meant a step up for Amanda. And when I had finished the article, all I knew is that her husband had died in 1942 and that he was a widow. So she had died somewhere between 1909 and 1940, 1942. And about Two years ago, I believe now, I had created a program called Hands on the Past and looking at history, murder, and the archive. And once the article came out, I decided to take my students to go retrace the actual, go to all the sites connected. So we went to Sedalia, Jefferson City, Kansas City, Warrensburg, um, yeah, I think that's all, and Columbia. And so we went to a multitude of archives, but what was interesting is that I actually had found out that well, we weren't really able to find out exactly how Amanda had died. She died in the 1920s. I argue 1926. But in fact, it wasn't this perfect marriage. In fact, I'd found some circuit court proceedings in the bottom of one of these archives as we're blowing off dust, again, trying to show my students this is what an archive world is. And when all of a sudden, we began to see some familiar names, and it turned out that Amanda had, in fact, moved back to Sedalia in the mid-1920s. So it sort of would see this relationship last roughly around 10 or 11 years. But according to her husband, she refused to have sex. She burned down, um, she burned down, I think, one particular room and sold all the stuff in another room and then moved back to Sedalia. And when I looked at census records for several years, she was posing as a single woman, a widowed woman, and then just married with a husband not to be found. And so during this time, they are beginning to undergo a divorce or really trying to get to that point, but she refused to come back to Warrensburg. But during that time she dies, the, the, the trail goes cold. But again, it wasn't until I physically went to the sites to go really look even more that these, these things could not be recovered online. So more or less, this story provides us a deeper understanding um, of black women and a whole other way, or at least this alternate gaze that allows us to deepen sort of this black heritage past, even if it's through the less celebratory. But nonetheless, um, this case is representative so much more because in many ways, I have found numbers of black women who um, also faced the Supreme Court for murder charges and, were, in fact, were um, pardoned. So nonetheless, this particular case and all of what it holds, it begins to deepen sort of our larger understanding of just the potentials and where we can go in uncovering sort of even more um, in the black past. So I'll sort of end there. And again, I'll open up to any questions that you all may want. OK, thank you. <laughs>